Hello, I'm Paul Bradshaw. And I'm Lauren Gray. Welcome to Viral History, your weekly fix of all things history. Coming up on this week's First World War special, I sit down with historian and analyst Peter Caddick Adams. And we visit a First World War trench system and find out just how tough conditions were for the British Tommy. But first up, the news. New analysis conducted by Cardiff University has dated a set of rare human footprints to the Mesolithic era. The footprints of children and adults found on the Gower Peninsula in 2014 are now thought to be 7,000 years old. Archaeologists in Norway have found a skeleton that may confirm a saga from the Viking Age. The human remains found at the bottom of a well at an abandoned castle seem to echo Sverre's saga, in which King Sverre's castle was sacked and the water supply destroyed by tossing one of the king's men into the well and filling it with rocks. And archaeologists from the University of Dundee have reconstructed the face of a Pictish man brutally murdered 1400 years ago. His skeleton was found in a cave in Rosshire with five head injuries and large stones holding down his arms and legs. Hello, I'm Anna Kay and you are watching Viral History. Now, 2016 marked the centenary of the Battle of the Somme, one of the darkest days in British military history. Yes, 100 years on and with a modern view on that disastrous offensive, I had the great pleasure in talking to historian, lecturer and analyst Peter Caddick Adams to discuss life in the trenches and this most bloody of battles. What were conditions like for the British Tommy in World War One? So if we think about conditions for the, the British Tommy in the First World War, uh, the initial observation is that no one is expecting to be in trenches uh, and if they are, for, for no period of time at all. So we associate the First World War with trenches, but that was never the intention. Uh, and the idea, of course, is to dig in to protect the gains you've made uh, and also to protect the troops from the weather. Uh, and it just happens that we stay in the trenches for three and a half years because we can't get out of them because of advances in military technology. So having said that, the easiest way to convey the trenches to a contemporary audience is think Glastonbury but without the waterproofing, without the Wellington boots, or anything like that. So all soldiers have is their ordinary woolen uniforms, which don't really protect them from the elements. Now, we have a problem when we're talking about trenches in the First World War, because the perception is that people go into the trenches and spend months on end in them. The reality is, certainly for the British soldiers, you will go in for no more than a week or ten days max, and be rotated through. So your time of misery, of trench foot, of freezing, of all the rest of it, it is never really longer than about seven to ten days. It's different for the Germans and the French. They tend to stay for months on end in the same trenches with, with all the sort of a deterioration in their morale and their health and so on. How and why did trench warfare develop? Trench warfare is, is very much an accident. Um, we can reach back to the American Civil War, we can reach back to uh, 17th century siege warfare. Soldiers have always dug trenches to protect them from enemy fire and a bit from the elements. So this is nothing new. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the development of trenches in the First World War is firstly their complexity. It isn't one line of trenches, it's several. They're interconnected. Uh, they're also dug in zigzag fashion to minimise the blast. Uh, and something else we forget is that most soldiers uh, live underground for the duration of, of their time in the trenches. There's endless dugouts, uh, and that's not where you just go during a, a, a bombardment. You live there, you sleep there, uh, all the rest of it. Um, but having said that, that sort of trenches are a very uh, ancient way of warfare, um, it, it's the fact that you blend onto them modern technology. So barbed wire, machine gun positions, uh, when gas arrives, um, you've got to protect soldiers from gas because gas is usually heavier than air, will sink straight into the trenches. Tanks are developed specifically to cross trenches. So the, the reason why First World War trench uh, tanks are very long is so that they can get over the trenches. So trenches actually trigger all sorts of other technological developments as well. In what ways did the Somme go wrong? The Somme is the natural development of the Brits and the French understanding that to defeat the Germans they've got to attack together. 
use the combined resources of both nations uh, and they'll launch a major attack in the Somme area because that's where the French and the British armies' uh, borders uh, uh, overlap. Uh, and so it's very much a sort of unified effort. Neither army is strong enough or has the resources to break through the German lines, but together they will. And something happens that ruins that plan. Very, very good idea. Masses of troops and artillery concentrated, punch your way through the German lines and roll them up. What happens is the, the Germans strike at Verdun first in February 1916. Uh, and the French are bleeding so much manpower that they can't support the attack on the Somme with any great strength, which was their original intention. Uh, and also, we need to launch the Somme early to take the pressure off the French. So the Somme is launched earlier than uh, first planned and without the huge majority of, of Frenchmen that we were expecting. Looking back from a distance of a hundred years, how significant was this battle? Was it Haig's great folly? There's nothing wrong with the Somme plan uh, as it stands, um, and it's a perfectly logical deployment of the military technology of the day. A week-long bombardment of thousands of guns literally drenching uh, the enemy lines with, with high explosive. Um, the problem with the Somme uh, comes in uh, in three forms. First, communication. So when something goes wrong at the front and your men are held up on the barbed wire, you don't have wireless equipment to radio back and say, stop, it's all going horribly wrong. Communications in those days are so primitive, you can't get that message back to higher commanders quick enough. So that's the first thing that happens. Um, the second is the duration of the campaign. Initially, it's expected to launch the attack in good weather, and within a few days, uh, the, uh, the German reserves, the trenches will be taken, uh, and the battle will be essentially over. Because the Germans resist for longer, uh, and it takes longer to punch our way through the ver various German trench lines, the campaign starts getting drawn out. Uh, and that means we run out of reserves, we start to run out of shells, the weather starts to change, uh, and although we're slowly grinding the Germans down, it's not the quick victory that everyone expects. Uh, and the third point is that, that Douglas Haig uh, continues with the battle, because if you are uh, the commander-in-chief of your armies, when do you suddenly stop and pull stumps and say, enough? Uh, if you're advised by your intelligence chief that the, one more push uh, and the Germans will win, do you suddenly stop? At what moment do you actually decide en enough is enough? Uh, and Hay quite rightly looks to his politicians who give him no guidance. They simply say, we want you to win the war, carry on, you're our senior military commander, our advisor, we'll do what you want. And he's got no yardstick about what is too much, what is enough. So he's gone down as the architect of this huge, huge tragedy. It, it was, there's, there's no inevitability about that. But wasn't this a military disaster by today's standards? Of the 120,000 British soldiers who are attacking on the first day, 60,000 become casualties, of whom 20,000 are killed, most of those before breakfast. Now, if we think that the British Army today is under 100,000 strong, we're talking about almost the entire British Army becoming casualties uh, and uh, a lot of the fatalities being suffered before breakfast has even finished. Slaughter on an industrial scale. And to get an even better understanding of life for the British Tommy in the First World War trenches, viral history came under fire with the Rifles Living History Society in a full-scale trench system that they've recreated themselves. Right, come on, come on, you're the reinforcements. We need you, we need you. Keep your heads down. Keep... Recreating the horrors of war. This reenactor group takes visitors back in time to the Great War, and for the men in uniform, it's a serious business. We're trying to give an accurate, as accurate as we can portrayal of what it was like, but while honouring and respecting our forebears that did this for real. This wasn't a game for them, it's not a game for us. One of our main things, apart from the entertainment side, is to educate people and educate, educate the kids of something that's now gone out of living memory. Let's go, let's go, let's go! The group also dispels myths about life on the front line. Tommy would only be in the trenches probably 48 hours at a time, and the stress would then mean you have to be rotated out of the line to rest, gradually back through the second and third lines, 
fatigue parties and then rest and then back in maybe two to three weeks later. Gas, 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 gas. The group simulates a gas attack as part of its display to illustrate just how poorly equipped soldiers were at the beginning of the war. I think the main problem was is the technology was moving much faster than people could react to it. And it was always the case of technology. If you think in 1914, no one had helmets, no one had gas masks. Within six weeks of the first gas attack in 1915, the British Army issued two million rudimentary gas masks in six weeks. And this is with the case all throughout the war, the sudden jumps in technology and having to counter the sudden jumps in technology all the way through the war. Communications is a case in point. Yes, we had telephone communications, but the lines were always being cut, so we were reduced to using runners and carrier pigeons because we just didn't have a way, we didn't have radio systems like they had in later wars. So again, it's all back to technology moving very quickly and trying to keep up with the evolution of war and technology. Yes, and the Rifles Living History Society will be on manoeuvres throughout 2017, so do check out their website for upcoming events. Speaking of events to remember, here's Marguerite. Second of March. Today in 1882, Roderick MacLean made an unsuccessful attempt to shoot for Queen Victoria as she left Windsor Railway Station. The crowd jumped him. Well, that's about it from us this week. Feel free to hit the subscribe button, follow Viral History on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, like this video and uh, tune in next week. And remember, what's past is prologue. See you next week. Lots of oomph. Oomph, yeah.